welcome to your two o'clock workshop. Um, this uh, workshop is going to be a little bit more uh, soul care maybe than work, but at the end we're going to do kind of a little activity together that I pray will be valuable to you in your um, just journey of, you know, becoming more aware of God in our lives. So um, I'm just going to start by praying over our session, so if you'll join me in that. Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this entire conference. God, I pray for those of us who even came with zero expectation, God. And I thank you, Jesus, that even in that, you are able to fill our cup. And God, I pray that this session would be um, really healing to some people who are in disappointing places of their life and ministry. And I pray that there would be some keys spoken today, Lord, that they could move forward and um, really see breakthrough in their lives. So we give this session to you. Pray over each one that's hearing it, that your presence would be in their literal situations, Lord, each and every one going through different scenarios. And so we thank you for being God, for being in control, and for knowing the plans that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm so glad that you came back. That's, that's good. <laughs> that means I didn't scare you off. And if you own a Winnie the Pooh jacket, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I had several people tell me that was the wrong thing to say. So, anyway. Well, um, it, I had a great night's sleep last night. Dan and I are staying in this really nice hotel, and every time I go to a hotel, they have pillows, pillows, people, that I can't seem to find at stores. I don't know where they get these pillows. Do you guys know about just good hotel pillows are really hard to find? If you've ever been to Leavenworth, to the Enzian Inn, I, I mean, if I've never, you know, stolen anything. But if I was going to steal, it would be the pillows at the Enzian Inn. And the pillows that we had last night in our hotel room were so soft and comfortable and our bed was so awesome. I just love it. But growing up as a uh, missionary kid, uh, living in Africa for a little while, uh, kind of traveling around the world, there's a lot of dumpy places that I have stayed in before, not always super nice. But one of the dumpiest places that I ever stayed was not in Africa, it wasn't in Europe, it wasn't in Russia, it was right here at the Fusion Conference. <laughs> so, my husband and I had set out to make the trip to Fusion with our children's ministry staff and we wanted it to be really, really special. So I had made little goodie bags for all the people that were coming with us. We wanted it to be really special. We had the van. We were trying to um, come up with creative ideas. We were going to do like a progressive dinner with them and, and really laugh a lot. But I did the terrible mistake of leaving the hotel reservation up to my very uh, amazing husband. <laughs> so. He looks online and, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? And he's like, man, I can't believe how cheap this hotel is. It looks awesome. It's got doors. It's standing. <laughs> so we, we begin the drive from Seattle. And I don't know how many people we had with us in our group. Maybe five or six. Okay, yeah, six, you know, plus Dan and I. So we're driving these people, and we're having a great time, and we're really wanting to spoil them. And the church that Dan and I were ministering at at the time um, is a beautiful church. If you've been to Eastridge Church in Issaquah, that's where we were at. Kind of looks like the Great Wolf Lodge. People's expectations are a little high um, there. And so, you know... <laughs> I, it would be far-fetched to say that they had stayed ever in their life in a dumpier place than we were at. So we're driving down the road, and it's getting later and later at night. And, you know, we have this reservation. And so, you know, we pass all the obvious ones we weren't staying in. You know, there goes the Red Lion. You know, there goes the Hilton. There goes, you know, the whatever, the, you know, Holiday Inn, then the Holiday Inn Express, then the Motel you know, six, the Motel 8, until they're gone. There's no more hotels. We are out of the hotel zone. I was like, honey, I think you missed it. Like, back there, all the hotels. And he's like, no, I mean, my GPS is, you know, telling us we're on the right track. And pretty soon it's getting darker and doctor darker. Now there's no street lamps, you know. And way off in the distance, we see this little group of lights. And he's like, oh, there it is. There's our hotel. And I was like, no, 
I don't think that's right. And above in the air, you, you, you see these red lights. They're kind of like this. <laughs> it was called the King's Inn, but it was like Ings Inn, right? <laughs> and I was like, honey, I don't think that's his Ings Inn. I don't think that's our hotel. No, honey, that's it. So we pull up to this place. And I, at the time, am like eight months pregnant. We open the door, and right next to us in the hotel is uh, some gas pumps. And I'm like, that's really weird. And we open the door, and just this terrible waft comes through. There were two cow feces, I'm not kidding you, trucks parked outside of this motel in which actually turned out I pretty think I think it was a brothel to be honest so we go and I close the door I'm gagging in the car I, I mean my pregnant body could not handle the waft of smell and I was like we are not staying here you know but I'm trying to whisper because we're supposed to be united and we're leading these people you know so I was like in sign language we are not staying here, you know and he's like I already paid and we don't have any more budget and I was like I will pay for this myself we're not taking the ladies here. He's like, babe, it's already 10 o'clock at night. Everywhere else is booked out. We have to stay here. So I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, where is the office? So we're looking around. Where is the office? Oh, it's in the 7-Eleven. So we walk over. We walk into the gas station. It wasn't even a 7-Eleven. It was like a 7-8 or something like that. So we, we walk in and the, the, the guy at the desk, I'm like, we're looking for the, the hotel office. And he was like, oh, yeah, here's your keys. I'm like, this is crazy. So Dan like, gets the keys and a Snickers bar, to which I was like, who has time to eat right now? And we go out, and we take these ladies up to their rooms. I'm not even kidding you guys. The wallpaper was half hanging off the walls like this. Yellow. They had those old, um, like, smoke they're trying to get the smoke out of the room because all the rooms we got were non-smoking there was hair in the bathroom all over the place yeah I'm not even kidding you we couldn't even sleep in the beds like they were you could almost feel like a film of like grease because it was that yeah I know all the ladies like this is so gross and the ladies were so sweet they humored us and we slept there it was so disgusting but I, I was so disappointed. I mean, I had such high hopes of impressing these ladies, of letting them come to a relaxing fusion retreat, of putting our best foot forward. And I tell you, I was so disappointed. And I tell you that funny story because I think that we all have something in our life where we are experiencing some great areas of disappointment. That we have expectations that haven't been met, whether it's in our families or our ministries or our finances or with our kids. Real big areas of disappointment. Well, as I'm studying this word disappointment, it literally means, as you look up the Old English, to turn away from your appointment. Disappointment means to turn away from your appointment. And I'm wondering if, because some of our expectations are so high, and we get so disappointed with the way life isn't turning out, whether it be our marriages, or with our kids, or our church, or our finances, we get so disappointed that we turn away from our appointments altogether. And we are completely unaware that God has a divine appointment for us in the midst of our disappointment. And that's what I want to talk to us about in this session, disappointing seasons in our life. And for some of us, we, we have great faith. We, we know the talk. We know to say, well, this is a rough season, but I know that God is faithful. And we say that, and we do believe it. But some of us have prayed for so long and so hard that we become too weary to pray anymore. We're too tired of trying to pray ourselves out of a disappointing place. And I wonder if God has a divine perspective change for you right in the middle of whatever area of disappointment you're going through. And as I say that word disappointment, I'm wondering what you're thinking about in your life. What is it that you're disappointed with? Is it a staff? Is it, is it where you're at? Is it your vocation, your location? Is it the way people see you or don't see you? Or is it something even bigger, something with your family, a real area of disappointment in your life? 
I, I uh, really do believe that God has a divine appointment for you waiting right in the middle of your disappointment. That you maybe have been praying for God to change the situation. Bring a miracle to the finances. Lord, would you do a miracle for my kids? Would you do a miracle in the church? Would you change me? Would you make it better? Would you do something, God? Anything, please. And yet sometimes I wonder if nothing is going to change right now in the situation except that God would change your mindset and the way that you see things right now. Um, I believe that the Lord wants to speak over those places in our life so that we might be able to even thrive right where we are at. I'm speaking to you from um, a very real perspective this afternoon because um, my husband and I just about a little over a year ago, we have been serving at Eastridge Church, the Great Wolf Lodge Church, for um, about nine years, loving where we were at, really thriving in ministry. It was a full steam ahead kind of church. Um, you know, events every weekend, it was a lot you know, give, 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 um, but we also thrived in it. We were loving it. And some good friends of ours that we had been on staff with years before called us and said, would you be willing to leave your church and come help us plant a second campus and be our campus pastors? To which we promptly said, no way. <laughs> we were like, we love you guys, but no, we love where we're at. But we'll pray about it, which is just code for we'll do nothing. So when people say, I'll pray about it, would you join our volunteer team? Let me pray about it. That means no. So <laughs> Unless they pray on the spot with you. But we told them we'll be praying about it, to which we promptly did nothing. So the Lord began to speak to us. He spoke to us in dreams. He spoke to us uh, through his word. We get, began to seek people out. And we were terrified that God was actually calling us out of our comfy, cozy life and was about to uproot us from Issaquah, where everything was cushy and wonderful, to the city of Linwood, where people wear beer bottle earrings. You know what I mean? It was like the capital of Aquanet. Which I love, you know, I'm a Texas girl at heart. But I mean, I was afraid. I was like, Lord, this can't be you. But I remember one night as I was wrestling with this appointment that God had for us to leave everything we knew and to go start something new and to convince our kids that we were going to pull them out of their schools and start brand new. And I had a dream. And in my dream, you know, sometimes they're not from God, but this one certainly felt like it was. Um, in my dream, I was at this new campus that they had asked us to lead. And there was nobody there, just an empty parking lot. And I saw a man walking across the parking lot. And all of a sudden in my dream, the man turned his face and it got really big. And it startled me awake and it was the face of my brother. And my brother's an atheist, doesn't believe in God. And the Lord had said to me as I, as I woke up startled, he said, there's more to this than you realize. And I said, all right, Lord, I will pray about it. I will ask you, Jesus, is this what you have for us? And so with a, really a broken heart and, um, you know, lots of love from our pastors, we went to them and sought counsel. And with great blessing, they released us to go and to start leading the second campus. Well, I wish I could tell you that, yes, it was awesome and God's, God was thriving in our life and ministry and my brother accepted the Lord. But I stand before you a year and a half later and the church is not even open yet. You see, when we first got there, our launch was supposed to be just a few months after we arrived. We were just supposed to do a few cosmetic things to the building, a church building that was given to um, the, new, the church there. And uh, we were really excited about it. But after paperwork, after paperwork, and the fire marshal came in, and, and uh, it was like disappointing news after disappointing news. And so many things were going wrong with the building. We thought, God, what is going on here? And then I remember in the midst of it, our own family, all of a sudden the furnace breaks down. You know, and here we are living in this older house. The furnace breaks down. It's freezing in the house. And we had just started Dave Ramsey, right? We had just gotten up to our $1,000, and out the $1,000 goes, you know, and the furnace is broken down. 
Two days later, my daughter comes to me and she says, Mom, my tooth cracked in half. And I was like, oh, man. Two days after that, the next daughter, Mom, my tooth cracked in half. I know what you're thinking. We feed them too much candy, which we do. Um, <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But, and then... On the fourth day, after all that had happened, the furnace, the cracked tooth, another cracked tooth, we're driving down the road, and the car breaks down. And I was just like, this is like a bad country song. I mean, come on. So the car breaks down on the side of the road. We ashamedly had to call my parents to come help us fix the car. We get the car fixed. We're driving down the road after we've put so much money into fixing the car. I'm driving down the road, and the car breaks down again. We take the car back to the mechanic. We put every last penny that we can to try to get the car moving again. We get the car working. We drive the car out of the lot, and the car breaks down again a third time. And right at that moment, I was like, oh, wait a second. Are we under spiritual attack or what? It was like this wake-up call. And, you know, Dan and I, for that entire you know, week and even longer than that, we were like silent ships passing in the kitchen. It was just depressed. It was like, hey, hey. Like neither of us even had to say anything. Just so low in our spirits, you know, believing that God is faithful, believing is trustworthy, but like this life is horrible, right? Everything is breaking down. And we began to pray and our prayers were disappointed prayers. God, where are you? Jesus, come fix the car. Why did you move us? Why is this happening? Why won't you come? And we were praying disappointed prayers to God. Now I'll say this, that our God will take any prayer you can offer. He's so good. But from our end, from our spirit, I remember waking up one morning and saying, enough is enough. Have we forgotten the God that we serve? Have I forgotten that he's able? Have I forgotten that he loves us? Have I forgotten that he wants me to pray a prayer of faith? And so I remember that morning, Dan and I woke up in the morning and we said, enough disappointed prayers. We're going to start to pray like we know who our God is. We're going to pray an appointed prayer for an appointed time that maybe God has an appointment for us right in the middle of a very disappointing place. And I remember our prayer that morning sounded so much different than all of the other prayers we had been praying. We began to declare who our God is. We began to believe it from our gut. We began to arm ourselves up, you know, that suiting armor saying, enough is enough. These are your cars, Lord. This is your land, Jesus. These are your kids, and it's your dental bill. <laughs> Good luck with that. You know, just praying like we knew who our God was. And in the middle of our prayer, the furnace went out again. What? We couldn't believe it. And Dan had just prayed that morning. He said, God, you're the kind of God that after you teach us what you so lovingly want to teach us, like a light switch, you can flip it back on. And he said, would you do that for us, Jesus? So we're sitting there going, I can't believe the furnace is out again. This is horrifying. And Dan just said, I don't know, Jesus. There's got to be an answer here. And I know God's not a genie. But you see, he was teaching Dan and I a deep lesson of how to really pray again. To believe that prayer works. That we can pray a prayer of faith and be encouraged and lifted up and watch our God move. And so Dan went over to the furnace and he's inspecting it with the flashlight, trying to figure something out. And he kind of looks in the back and right in the back of the furnace is a switch. Dan's like, huh, flips the switch back on and the furnace comes back on. <laughs> no, I don't know. Either, the, either that's coincidence or it was God trying to show us, even in our hearts, that there are some times when he allows us to be in a season of disappointment because he lovingly wants to teach us how to depend on him wholeheartedly. But you know that our God is powerful enough to flip of a switch, make something different. So when things aren't going different, God has a divine appointment for you right in the middle of your disappointment in your life. Um, I believe that some of us are in a training that we can't skip over. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write down, I'm in a training I can't skip over. Some of us are headed to a new season of life. 
And you've been in this rut for a long time. I believe that God is about to bring you to a new season. And all of these areas of disappointment, all of this numbness and sameness and ongoingness, God is about to do something new. And we are in a training that we cannot skip over. Well, I don't want to speak to you without sharing with you the Word of God, which is the most life-giving, most profound, and such a great teaching tool, as you know. And I was studying. Here we were in the middle of this disappointment, and I was studying the book of Gideon. And so I wanted to share with you just a few key things in the book of Gideon because if you've studied it at all, you know the story. But there were some things in this story that I was profoundly shaken by as it relates to disappointment in my life. So I want to start, and I'm just going to um, hit a few highlights, so don't nod off on me as I start to read. But it starts in Judges chapter 6. And if you remember the story of Gideon, the Israelites, remember, they were fighting against the Midianites. And really, it was like a modern-day ISIS. I can put it that way. This was their reality. The Midianites were beheading the Israelites. They were stealing all of their livestock, their food. They were taking the women and the children. And it caused the Israelites to have to flee for their life. And they were hiding in the hills. And that's where we find Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And this is what it says right here in this first verse, uh, or chapter 6, verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in the Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, if you've done any study on this, I want to stop right there. Gideon is in one of the most disappointing places you can imagine. He is trying to make bread in a wine press. Now, wine presses were rocks where you would crush grapes, and wheat, in order to thresh any wheat, as you probably know, you had to be out in an open field so that you could thresh the wheat, and the chaff could be blown away, and you could harvest the grain. But here he is in a situation that doesn't make any sense to him. He's in a very disappointing place. You see, he could have made wine, maybe they could have drown their sorrows right from the Midianites but their family needed some bread they needed some sustenance and here Gideon is doing a very disappointing job trying to thresh the wheat in a wine press the wheat can't blow away there's probably a covering in the rock and the wind doesn't flow into the the cave so to speak like he wanted to and I wonder if you're in a situation like that with your family or with your job and you're just like, Lord, it's like drudging through the mud right now. Why have you put me in this place? This doesn't make any sense. Especially if you've asked me to make bread. You've asked me to minister in a certain way and you've put me in a wine press? That doesn't make any sense at all. So here Gideon is in this very disappointing place. And it goes on to say in verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And we love that verse, but it is so funny because Gideon did not like to hear that. In fact, he was not in a good mood. Gideon was so disappointed with where he was at in the wine press, maybe a little angry with God, a little filled with fear. And he says, wait a second, how in the world can you come and tell me that God is with me in this situation? And I wonder if you are in a place where you're like, God, I don't see you anywhere. How could you be with me? And this is Gideon's reply in verse 13. He says to the angel of the Lord, mind you, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And you know what? I know that Dan and I have said that in this very season of life we're in right now. God, if you are with us, why? Why has all this happened to us? Where's your favor? Where's your calling? Where's your provision, God? Right? Where are you in this season of our life? He says, and he says, where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hands of the Midianites. 
See, but Gideon had forgotten that it wasn't actually the Lord who had put them in the hand of the Midianites. It was their own hearts that had come completely out of his covering. They began to worship idols and turn to other things that might meet their needs. And you know, I can look at the book of Gideon and go, you guys are idiots. You should have served God. What are idols? But who am I in my own situation when I don't see the hand of God? When I start to go to different things, I start to panic and make away from myself or manipulate relationships or try to make something work or muster something up in this place. And that alone is my own idolatry. Saying, God, I don't trust you anymore. And here is Gideon asking the question, where is God? But this is what I love about our God. The angel doesn't go into this long debate about who God is and where God is. He says in the very next breath to Gideon, he simply says, get up and go, mighty warrior. And I wonder if you have been debating God for a day too long. And the Lord has not been humoring you in giving you an answer. And maybe today the Lord is saying, enough. Enough debating. Enough saying, God, where are you? Enough pulling out your hair. Enough living in a desperate place. Enough being stuck. And now it's time just to get up and go, mighty warrior. It's time to quit and get up and go and come back to life and do impossible things and walk forward in a place where you say, Lord, this is an impossible situation, right? So we're learning, learning these lessons from Gideon. I wonder what you are saying um, to that situation in your life. And Gideon response as you probably know he says to the angel of the lord but i can't go i'm weak i'm insecure i'm the least of my clan and i'm the least of my family he says to him and i wonder if you might say some of those things over your health situation over your church over your job you're you're stacking up everything against the lord all your logic of why things don't match up. You're saying, I'm weak, Lord, and there's no way in the finances and this and that. And we're, we're showing God all the things of why we can't do what he's asked us to do or why we can't move forward in faith or why our spirit is so dead inside. And God is saying, enough. Get up and go, mighty warrior. And as you know, the story of Gideon, we fast forward to Gideon getting up from the wine press and going to lead this army of people to defeat the Midianites. And so it's 32,000 of Gideon's men against 135,000 of the Midianites. That's one to four. They know they're going to lose right off the get-go. And as you know, the Lord says to him, that's still too many for you to know that it was really me. And so it goes down to 20,000 men against the Midianites. That's still too many, Gideon. He takes it away, and now 10,000, all the way down to just 300 men. They're definitely not going to win. And do you feel like that? There's no way, Lord, that I can win in this situation. I can't win with my boss. I can't win with these people. I can't win in my life. I can't win, Lord. And he's like, all right, time to get up and go. Right? What, Lord? I can't get up and go until you replenish all the people. So you replenish the finances. So you replenish everything, Lord. But this is our God. He loves to surprise us, right? And God wants us to lean into that 300, that little that we see. Sometimes we look at that and we say, God, you're such a taker. Even, if, you know, it's like here you are. You're requiring all the stuff of me. The church takes from me and people take from me. And you're a taking God. But I'm here to tell you that God is a giving God. He always gives. He never stops giving. That's who he is. But we've got to have a mindset shift that we don't serve a, a taking God. We serve a God who is giving. And he was about to give Gideon a victory like nobody had ever known. Okay, so all that backstory, and here is the thing that hit home the most. 
So Gideon, terrified before this battle, he's got 300 men surrounding the camp of 135,000 Midianites. And the Lord knows that he's afraid. And he says, all right, Gideon, I know that you're afraid. So I want you to sneak into the camp. And I want you to listen. And so he sneaks down and he listens. And he hears this guy say from the Midianites, I, I had this weird dream last night that a giant loaf of bread rolled into the camp and it killed us all. And I think that God has given us into the hands of Gideon. Okay, rewind. Where was Gideon when you first saw him? He was trying to make bread in a disappointing place. And here he has overheard that the very thing he was doing at the beginning, trying to make bread, is the very thing that rolled down the hill to kill the enemy. I wonder if the Lord is trying to show you that he can do what's in your disappointing place. He can kill your enemy right there. The enemy of your soul. The one who's lying to you to tell you to doubt that you're stuck. That you'll never be free. And the enemy and the Lord can use that very thing. And this is what I love. So here, here he overhears this dream that a loaf of bread has rolled in and killed all of the Midianites. And so Gideon runs back up and he's like, okay, I think God's actually going to follow through. So let's break some tiny pots and let's raise a little horn and let's give a little toot and we'll see what happens. I mean, when you read that story, it's just so ridiculous, right? So they blow their trumpets and they raise their sword, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. And they go down, but before they can even get there, the enemy is so consumed with fear that they start killing each other and everybody's killing each other. And they get down there and everybody's dead except for their leader who has fleed, Zeb. And Zeb is running for his life and Gideon and the tiny 300 men are chasing after Zeb. And you'll never guess where they killed the leader of the Midianites. In a wine press, which is to this day called the wine press of Zeb. You see, Gideon, who started out trying to thresh the wheat in the wine press, later on would defeat the enemy in the very same place, in a wine press. And this is not in any commentary I read. But as I read it, I was so blown away. And if it's not biblically correct, you know, Lord, you can come and bring truth. But I just thought this was so interesting. Gideon, at the beginning of his story, is threshing wheat, the bread, in the wine press, the wine. The very body of Christ that we would later on foreshadow that Jesus would come and defeat the enemy of our soul this foreshadowing of what God can do in a disappointing place, that God can defeat the enemy of our soul, and that is exactly what he wants to do for us. You see, Gideon was about to be given a divine appointment in the middle of a very disappointing place. And I wonder if the Lord has the same for you. I wonder if you've been asking him to change the situation. You've been praying a, a, a very specific prayer for a long time. And the Lord is asking you to have a mindset shift today and say, All right, Lord, I'm preparing myself for battle in a place that I wish you would move me. But God, what is it? What is my divine appointment in this disappointing place? And how will you use this to bring victory, not only to my life, but also to the lives of people around me? I know that Gideon with the 300 men certainly felt ill-equipped to do the task that God had sent him out to do. And I wonder if you too feel ill-equipped Ill -equipped Maybe ill-equipped in the body you're in. Ill-equipped with your finances or with your church or with your staff, with your team. Um, whatever it is that you feel ill-equipped with. I wonder if the Lord would speak to that very 300 that you hold in your hand and say, All right, I've dwindled it down to basically nothing so that you could call upon the name of the Lord. You could accept the place I've put you and you can fight a battle that proclaims my name. Priscilla Shire, who uh, wrote a Bible study on Gideon, if you haven't done it, you should. She says this, sometimes you don't need all that you think you need. And I tell you what, there's a lot of times when I think I need a lot more than I really do. Well, I want to um, 
I'm not sure how we are on time because I want to give you some time to um, do a little assignment together. Ten more minutes? Okay. So um, I just want to tell you a really quick story and then I want to um, have us pray with one another. But um, when uh, my, my son, we have three kids, uh, they're 13, 10, and 6, and when my little boy was born, it was such a surprise. And I was in a place in my life and ministry even where I really felt like we're finally going somewhere. My kids were finally out of diapers. Um, I was getting lots of uh, invitations to go speak and, and, and do things in ministry. And I found out I was pregnant and I was very, very disappointed. And it was one of these places of disappointment that, that I couldn't tell a lot of people because I had friends who were even struggling to have children of their own. And so here I was harboring this disappointment over this baby that was supposed to be a great joy from the Lord. And I just wondered why, God. I thought that you were setting me up to do the call of God on my life. And here you have taken it away from me. And I remember going through a real season of um, depression during that. Just thinking, God, why? Oh, it's such a setback in my life to be the stay-at-home mom again. And laundry and dishes and diapers. And, and I thought, Lord, that we were on track, you know, with this call on my life. And... Um, I remember one morning when Andrew was crying and the house was a wreck and I just t went to take a shower just to try to get my head clear and I just said, God, how can you help me? And he said, will you give me 30 days? And I was like, okay, 30 days of what? <laughs> and he said, I'll give you an assignment. I want you to wake up in the morning and make your bed. What? <laughs> I don't make my bed. <laughs> he said, I want you to wake up in the morning and for 30 days I want you to make your bed and I want you to pray over your marriage and I want you to pray over all that God has in store for you in that area. And then I want you to do laundry. Lord, are we in the 50s? <laughs> I was like, no way. And as you do the laundry for your family, I want you to ask the Lord to launder your spirit. Lord, what are my attitudes? What are my thoughts? Then he said, I want you to do one load of dishes each day. This is Jesus meeting me right where I was at. And he said, as you put the dishes away, I want you to pray over the priorities in your life. Lord, where am I seeing things wrong? What are your priorities for me? And then I want you to do the laundry and not just put it in a big mountain like I normally do, but just for 30 days. I want you to pray over the identities of every single person in your home. Pray a blessing over them. Pray over them. Pray over your own identity as you put your clothes in. All of that represents to you. And then he said, I'll give you 30, day, day, 30 words for 30 days. Are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. And I remember it was that quickly the Lord just gave me a download of 30 days with him. And I began to write down 30 words just in a quick two minutes. Faith, fear, worry, all of these words. And he said, you start tomorrow, 6 a.m., wake up with me, and I'll give you scriptures on that word of the day. And then I want you to do those spiritual disciplines throughout the day and let me love you in this disappointing place. And I didn't realize that I was writing my very first book, and it's called Faith, Friendship, and Focus. And the Lord allowed me then to do that book with a group of women and then to take communion after that 30 days and ask him to reset my life in a disappointing place as a housewife. And I began to love my family again. I began to, to learn again how to pray over their identities. And God began to give me a divine appointment in a very disappointing place. And had it not been for that place, I never would have um, dreamed the vision that I have dreamed even now as I run a ministry and have a vision for missions around the world and writing and for women would never have happened had the Lord not provided me a place that was very disappointing at the time. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to take that piece of paper if you got one. If you didn't, you can raise your hand. Dan will get you one. Just a blank piece of paper. And I want you to do two things. I want you to write down your disappointment. Maybe it's just a word. Maybe it's um, a lot. I want you to write down the place of disappointment in your life. And then right under that, I want you to just take a quick minute and ask the Lord, what is my divine appointment in the midst of my disappointment? What could that look like for me? So I'm just going to give us um, two minutes here and I know that's not a lot of time so maybe you just put a brief synopsis but number one what is your disappointment 
And number two, what might be your divine appointment in that very place? So let's just take a quick minute here. I know that some of you are still writing, kind of sitting with that, and maybe you are unable to answer the second one, which um, I can totally relate with, and it's not a problem, because God sees the divine appointment for you. But I, I wonder if in the next month even, you would just inquire of the Lord. Lord, what's your divine appointment for me? Would you turn my eyes back to you and suit me up to... Um, feel strengthened again, feel like I can succeed where I'm at, feel like I, you can encourage me, that I am equipped because of your Holy Spirit to do what you've asked me to do. So then I want to ask you to do something very bold right now, and maybe it's just one word, um, but would you do this in the last just like three minutes? Would you get in groups of like two or three? And I just want us to pray for one another over that place of disappointment. And I know that this could be, um, maybe it's too personal. Maybe you just need to say, I'm just really disappointed right now. And then somebody could just pray over that. Or maybe you might say, our finances or whatever. Or maybe you want them to pray over the divine appointment, this calling God's tugging on your life. So let's just take a few minutes and just share it real briefly. This isn't a counseling session, so don't go into the story. Just share one word or just a phrase. That's it. No questions from the person praying. And then just allow the Holy Spirit to, to speak through you. And then take turns and swap one word or a phrase and have someone pray over you. So let's take a few minutes to do that right now. Today, I pray God for the areas of our lives where we've 
concede only half of your um, good that's being done. I pray that you would give us endurance to know that you're at work and uh, that in many places, maybe like Gideon, you are taking away so that um, we know it's you and it's not us. And Lord, I pray that um, you would do that even through that visible body, Lord, that you would just let her know that it's you working in her and not her, Lord. Uh, and in many ways, that seems counterintuitive uh, to the way weight loss works, Lord. But we know that you're about a miracle, you're the guy who made her, and you're the God uh, who knows everything about her. Lord Jesus, I just join with these people who are praying, and you can continue to pray if you're doing that. But God, I pray that you would cover every single deep place of disappointment in this room. God, I pray for a season of great victory, Lord Jesus. And I pray that the victory would start in our spirits, where we would begin to believe you again, where we would begin to pray like we're in battle, Lord Jesus, where we would not allow the enemy to discourage us, Lord God, but you would give us a a mindset shift where we would begin to see you at work, Lord, and instead of questioning why, we would get up and go, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for every single person that came to this workshop, and God, I just ask that this wouldn't just be a nice thing they heard, but they would have a true encounter in their life, that there would be fruit from what they heard today, that they would be able to put it into action and that they, their spirit would be a fighting spirit once again. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for equipping us to do your work. Give us each a divine appointment, Lord, that we could see the fruit, Lord, of leaning into you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.